this psalm is a psalm of orientation. It's a psalm uh, that we talked about last week. It's the kind of uh, scheme that we talked about. So we have psalms of orientation, psalms of uh, uh, disorientation and psalms of reorientation. This idea that a psalm of orientation is one that is really about the fact that all is well with the world for the psalmist. They, they, they see clearly what the world is, they see clearly who God is, and they see clearly who they are, and they live in the midst of that. So I thought it would be a good idea as we're working through this kind of scheme and this sense of uh, how the psalms work in our lives, that we start with this psalm of orientation. If you didn't hear the talk last week, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it because it actually sets out kind of how we're going to look at the psalms over these next few months and how we're going to use them. This particular psalm is a song, it's a big long song all about creation. We discover as if we didn't already know that the world is astonishing and beautiful. But we discover something much more than that. We discover that this creation has a creator and also a sustainer. See, I, I, when we travel, you remember that, travel, uh, that thing where you can go further than you can walk, you know, that thing that means you can go outside of Edinburgh. It's, it's a remarkable thing. There are these things called aeroplanes that take you all over the, this whole world. It's amazing. Um, but uh, when we travel, I, I, I love to go to cities uh, and visit cities and see the built environment and see what humans have done uh, in places and made it beautiful. So I, some of my favorite places I've been fortunate to go to, San Francisco, you've got this incredible Golden Gate Bridge that joins, uh, that covers this expanse of water. You, um, Washington DC and the mall there, you have this incredible story of America laid out in one big strip. It's, it's remarkable. And then you have uh, places um, like Sydney where you've got the harbor uh, area, Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House and humans have built incredible things and oh by the way the city we live in is on any global uh, list of incredible places that have been built by human hands that tell an incredible story and it's amazing, absolutely takes your breath away when you stand and look at Edinburgh from Carlton Hill or, or whether you're uh, in San Francisco looking at the Golden, it's astonishing what humans have been able to do and yet this psalm has no interest in, in what humans have been able to do, but are much more interested in the uncultivated nature, in the beauty that takes our breath away when we just see nature as it is. We are dead fortunate to live in a country that's filled with places like this. Uh, I, I immediately think of Glencoe and the, the rugged nature of Glencoe. I had the privilege a couple of years ago of camping out in Harris which might be one of the most beautiful places I've been in all my life. It's just astonishing. From a moon, I can see Joan putting her thumb up there. From the moonscape of the eastern side of Harris to the western side, where you think you've been transported to the Caribbean with these beautiful turquoise waters and white sands, it, it takes your breath away. It's genuinely astonishing. And lots of people who care about nature can get this far. It's a common appreciation. It's almost, it's inherent in our humanity to get awestruck when we see these things. You don't have to be a Christian to appreciate it or to have a transcendent moment before creation. But that's only a partial experience according to the psalmist. You see, this appreciation of beauty and of nature is meant to draw us to the more beautiful to the creator himself. For the psalmist, nature is like a window. See, we, we don't look at windows typically to admire the beauty of the window. Instead, we look at the window to see the beauty that is beyond. And so nature is supposed to function like that. We look at the beauty of nature, not for its own purpose, but to see the beauty beyond. This is what the psalmist is trying to tell us. But I think there are three other things. There's actually loads more. I, I, I didn't really know this psalm until I started looking into it this week. And we could be here for weeks on all of this. But I promise you we won't be. I have three simple uh, things I'd like us just to think on in this psalm. The first is that God is king. See, at the very beginning in verse 1 and then in uh, verse 31, 
we discover that God is king. He has wrapped himself in light as with a garment. It's the idea is of the king being in charge. And then in verse 31, again, his glory is referred to. There is a, there is a king of this creation. We must never lose sight of that. Someone owns creation and someone orders this creation. You see, the world, uh, Walter Brueggemann tells us, is God's way of bestowing blessing on us. Our times are ordered by God according to the seasons of the year, according to the seasons of life, according to the needs of the day. In all of these processes, we find ourselves safe and free. We know that out of no great religious insight, but because that is the way life comes to us. There's something in the ordinary nature of life that declares there's a rhythm and a pattern here that is ordered, properly ordered. And if that's true, it says someone has ordered it. It's not an accident. There is a king and he orders this creation that he owns. And here's the thing for us. If there's a king over creation, that means there's a king over us. And our choice then is what will we do with that? How will we respond? Keep that in your mind. We'll come back to it. So the second thing I want us to, to see from this psalm is that the psalm's not naive. Because it would be easy to read this and see all the beauty and the majesty and to think, yeah, that's fine, but where's real life? So I want to remind you, this is a psalm of orientation. This is a guy who's at peace with the world, so he's not focused on the brokenness of the world. We will have other psalms that are focused there. But, but here's the thing. It's still present in this text. It's not naive to the brokenness of this world. The psalmist say, points out that there is chaos and brokenness, and right at the end, sin. This is what the water symbolizes. The sea in the Old Testament is a symbol of chaos. It's a symbol of evil. And in verse 9, we get this little verse that says this, You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. See, the whole point here is God has bounded the chaos. It cannot run wild. That there is chaos does not have ultimate victory i think if the psalmist knew of romans 8 he would be tipping his hat at this point to the fact that god works all things for good not that all things are good but that god works all things for good that's the second thing the psalm's naive finally creation isn't simply created it's sustained one of the things I read this week was talking about um, this uh, psalm and they used uh, the example of God as architect in that first part. And I hope you can see how that's the case. And then the second, they talked about God as gardener uh, and in particular God as a good gardener. See, he hasn't just planted and then disappeared. That's the kind of gardening I do. I go, to the, I go down to Dobby's. I get my plants, they look beautiful, I stick them in the ground, I go away, I come back three weeks later, and I wonder why they're all surrounded by weeds and I can't see any of these pretty flowers. It doesn't work for me, because I am a terrible gardener. Because gardening requires constant attention. It requires you to be involved in the process. It requires you to watch how much water has come and how much uh, you need to dig the soil and to... Uh, get rid of the weeds and whether or not the plant needs pruned and these kinds of things. A good gardener is very involved in the process. God is very involved in the process. This wasn't six days hard work and then disappear. He isn't just a powerful God who put all this in place and then went for a snooze. In fact, he's involved. And that tells us something. It tells us that he is good. One of the things that we see in verse 29 and 30, it says here, When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. This, 
this word spirit and breath is the same word in Hebrew. It's the word ruach. It's the same word. And it's being held together. The psalmist is doing a poetic thing. And what he's saying is he's asserting that the world is moment by moment depending, dependent on the life-giving presence and power of God. As one commentator put it, God's breathing matters decisively, as though God were a great, reliable ventilator. It's his breath that keeps everything alive. Profoundly significant. But he isn't just powerful, he's good. And so he's not just leaving this world as it is. It's not just a case that, well, we've got this brokenness, some created by humans, some just because it seems that in the order of brokenness in our world there's pain and sorrow. We read in Colossians that in Jesus Christ, he is making all things reconciled to himself. The sin referenced at the end here, the chaos, the evil, they are dealt with by Jesus he takes all the sin of the world onto himself on the cross. The chaos and evil of our world are dealt a final and fatal blow with his resurrection. Jesus is in some ways, I think, God's final word in creation. And the pinnacle of Jesus' work is summed up in Revelation 21. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. See, that's always been the goal. From the Garden of Eden to the great Garden City, this is the goal. God to be with his people. But that being with his people in this recreated world, it says this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's the great promise. And that is the pinnacle of this psalm. See, we see the beauty of creation, but it points us to a creator. A creator who hasn't just disappeared, but is in, intimately involved in sustaining this creation. So what should we do? Well, first and primarily, I think we need to look at creation. We need to admire creation. We need to be awestruck by creation. We need to enjoy creation. But most importantly, we need to see through creation to the one who created, who is sustaining, the one who is seated on the throne and who has done the work to fix this creation, our good and loving God, shown to us perfectly in Jesus Christ. It demands a response. It demands a response that we would live well before God. That we would recognize him as king and serve him. So when we wake every morning, that we do think God is in charge of this. Our baptism says, yes, I, we are special. But it is based in the fact that we know God is powerful and in control. Um, our our uh, kids in their kids' time have also been encouraged to in their waking every day, to think on the fact that God is, is love, that he is in charge of this world. And that is the first thing we need to do with creation. The second is we are to care for this creation. We're, we are to be stewards of it. There's a whole sermon in this, but um, we're to be stewards. Not, not because it's a command, but as an act of love, as an act of worship. We get involved. So when you take your plastic out to the recycling, it's an act of worship. When you decide to separate your food waste from your regular waste and you have to get your hands all dirty doing that, it's an act of worship. These are the things that we get to do. And there are many more projects locally and internationally that we can get involved with. You obviously, we heard this morning some of what Joel and Esther are up with too with Creative Energy. And we would love uh, you to speak with them. But there are loads of different ways to get involved. And we should do. Christians should be at the forefront of creation care because it's an act of worship for us. It's not something we have to think twice about. Is this a good idea or not? It is just a good idea. So get involved. We get to partner with God 
in the work of reconciling all things to himself. This is the privilege that Psalm 104 brings to us. This Psalm of orientation says, when all is well with the world, this is what it's like. And we're invited to participate in that. Amen. May the blessing of God, creator of heaven and earth, rest upon you and upon all that God has made. May the risen Christ, Jesus, transform your life and your vision so that you may live in reconciliation with all things. May the power of God's Holy Spirit move over this whole earth like the breath of spring to renew the earth and all its people so that all creation may join together in praise to God's holy name. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.